back with Nehemiah Gordon this week, and he is going to be revealing things from ancient Hebrew sources, ancient Hebrew documents, manuscripts that have never been translated. In fact, they have never even been printed in Hebrew. He's going to go and take us back because this prophetic utterance that would be called forth in the last days, where the Gentiles in Israel will call upon the name of Yehovah, has been hidden in plain sight, but not in such plain sight that anyone can see, because the New Testament, Shaul's letters, Paul's letters say that the oracles of God, the communication of God was committed to the Jews. And instead of the Gentiles, trusting in and relying solely on translations and interpretations by Gentiles 2,000 years and 8,000 miles and uh, culturally completely removed from the land of Israel, having no idea what rabbinic Judaism of the first century that Yeshua was constantly interacting with, instead of go, going out completely to Gentile sources, Nehemiah is going to take us into these ancient sources. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't give you one verse answers here at Root Awakening. We wanna get into the background on these things, and so this is for those who really want to know the truth. Those who have been given the gift of the love of the truth, because you can't get enough truth. If you're just into religion, you probably have already tried Turn the channel. But if you want the truth, the truth will set you free. Nehemiah, please take us, take us yeah. into the sources now. So, so last week, Michael, we, we talked about um, how scholars and serious scholars, I'm not talking about you know wackadoodles on Facebook, I'm talking about serious university scholars who are trying to understand how the, the name was pronounced, the name of the father was pronounced in ancient times will go to the depths of every pagan, magical, and Gnostic source, anybody but the Jews. And it's somewhat of a mystery of why they won't look at Jewish sources. Um, and I started doing some study about this a few months back. I, I had, I'd read a book in which this one scholar had said, and a seri again, a serious scholar, he, he said this name Yehovah is a distinctly Christian form that no Jew ever thought the name was Yehovah, and it was simply the Christians misunderstanding what they saw in the Hebrew manuscripts. And it got me to ask a question I'd never asked before. And the question I, it forced me to ask, it, it made me ask was, what do the rabbis say the name is? Because I'd only looked at the Bible, and mm -hmm. I at that time had found the name in five Hebrew manuscripts, um, in a period, think about that, of 15 years or more. Yeah, these are Bible manuscripts, Bible manuscripts where right. all of the vowels appear, so exactly. it could be pronounced. Right, it's the Aleppo Codex, the Leningrad Codex. I'd found it in five Hebrew manuscripts at the time. Um, and I, but I never even really asked the question, what do the rabbis say the name? And it is a good question. Mm -hmm. So I called my book Shattering the Conspiracy of Silence. And the idea behind that name is that we have an actual conspiracy that's described in the Babylonian Talmud, the Tractate of Kedushin 71a, and it's brought, we even have the name of the head conspirator. His name is Rabba mm. Barbarchana. It's kind of a hard mm. name to say. Rabba Barbarchana. And he lived around the year 250 to 300 AD. And he says as follows He said, Sages transmit the four letter name to their disciples once in a seven year period. So what he's describing is by the year 250, Jews were no longer commonly speaking the name. It had been forbidden by the Romans, and there was an internal reason to suppress people healing in the name. Um, and it's really interesting. We talked last week how there were both Jews and probably also Jews who believed in Yeshua who were healing in the name of the Father, yud heh vav -Hey, and the rabbis wanted to suppress this, the Romans wanted to suppress this, so everybody was happy, right? But the rabbis still preserved this name, and they preserved it by transmitting it from rabbi to disciple once every seven years. So that's a conspiracy of silence. We know, meaning we, the rabbis, know what the name is. We don't want the multitudes, and definitely not the Christians, to know, meaning that was really part of it. They were saying what they defined as Christians or Messianic Jews, Nazarenes, using this name, or as they saw, maybe even abusing the name, we said, let's just ban it. And they said, we'll ban it until when the Messiah comes. 
and they talk about how it's it's permissible, not permissible to speak it in this world, but in the world to come when the Messiah reigns as king, then we'll speak the name. But to preserve the name, they transmitted it, Rabbi, to disciple once every seven years. So now, now in that, uh, that was actually a ceremony. Uh, uh, that, well, that is so 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 you're jumping ahead because I told you about this. Oh, Here, so okay. so <laughs> yeah, we're we're, 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 we're letting you. We're spoiler letting you, alert! Yeah, we're letting you in on what we get to do for hours and hours and hours and hours. Right. You get a little bit of this, and, and so this this right, is last so exciting. Night, Michael got the six-hour version. I'm going to give you the condensed version this time, guys. All right. So um, so at the time I wrote the book Shattering the Conspiracy of Silence in 2012, I knew about this source. I didn't know about the other sources. Okay. And what I knew is that the rabbis in the Talmud in the year 250 AD are telling us they transmit the name every seven years. But the reason scholars will plumb the depths of every pagan source for the pronunciation of the name is they don't believe what the Talmud says. They say, come on, the rabbis didn't really transmit the name once every seven years. Surely if they did that, we'd find traces of it in later Jewish sources, right? Mm -hmm. And where are those traces? Meaning, we have over 100,000 Jewish books, and I mentioned to you I have a database with over 100,000 Jewish books. It came out of bar University. It costs about $1,000 with all the updates. And scholars at bar University have been typing in Jewish books since the 1970s. To the point oh. where they've gotten to so many books, you can do a search, and you're not looking at all of Jewish literature, but you're looking at a large percentage of every Jewish book that's ever been written. It might be, and I don't know the number, but it's somewhere between 25 and 75% of all Jewish books ever written oh. that have survived. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other books in manuscript that have never been printed. There's other books that, you know, they'll eventually get to, right? Um, so... Um, Anyway, so and I gotta tell you a funny story about this. So I, I went to get an update. You gotta get an update every few years on this database. And I went to get the update and I paid the money for the update. It was a couple hundred dollars. And they say, okay, well, we have a guy in Jerusalem that you can get it from. You don't have to come all the way to Tel Aviv where Barlon University is located. So I go to somebody's apartment in, in Jerusalem <laughs> and, he, and he's an ultra-Orthodox Jew. And he looks at me and he says, why do you want this database? This is 100,000 books written by rabbis. You're, you're not wearing a kippah. <laughs> Why would you be interested in this? And I said, I paid the money. Are you not going to give it to me? And, you know, I got all defensive. And um, he says, no, I'm seriously, like, genuinely asking. I've never seen somebody who doesn't wear a kippah, who's not an ultra-Orthodox Jew, be interested in a database of 100,000 rabbinical books. And I said, well, I'm a, I'm a researcher of ancient Jewish sources. All right, no problem. Not, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to start a fight. I, I've just never seen it before. So, <laughs> so, so I get this database, Michael. Calm down, man. Yeah. Right, well, I, I, I'm Israeli. I get defensive, you know. So I get this database. And I'm asking the question, are there any rabbis who say what the name is? And I think, you know, I don't think there are. If there were, I would have heard about it, right? If somebody's writing a paper, a serious paper in a scholarly journal about the, how the Gnostic pronounced the name, and I've never read a paper, and I've read, I think, everything there is in, uh, on the name, just about, in, in, in academic scholarship, surely somebody would have published this, right? It must be there, and I would know about it. So I put in the little, in the, it's a flash drive, I put it in, I, it's all in Hebrew. Even the interface is in Hebrew. You know, it doesn't say search, yeah. it says chapes, right? So I type it in and I do a little search and I'm like, I know I'm not going to find it. Within 30 seconds, I found a rabbi who said the name is Yehovah. Within literally within 30, 30 seconds. seconds. Within Fine. literally 30 seconds, I found a rabbi who said the name, uh, the Shema Mifurash, the explicit name, the unequivocal name, is with the vowels shva cholam kamatz, and you're going to hear that, guys, over and over today. Shva cholam kamatz, those are the names of the vowels. They have vowel, names, the vowels. Shva mm -hmm. is that little E in Yehovah. Uh, cholam is the O, and the uh, kamatz is the A. So, the, so this rabbi says unequivocally, without a question, he says, as a matter of fact, yeah, as we know, the vowels are, or he doesn't say as we know, he says the, the, you know, the vowels of the name, which are shvacholam kamatz. He states it matter-of-factly. Within 30 seconds, I found that. And I, and I was sitting there shaking. I didn't think I would find it. And there I found it in 30 seconds. And I realized, if I found this in 30 seconds, and all I did was search in the database. Now, I had to have the database, database and I had to be able to read Hebrew and search in Hebrew. But literally, it took me 30 seconds to find it. And what it made me realize is if I could find it in 30 seconds, and nobody's ever talked about this that I've ever read in, in scholarship. They're talking about the Gnostics, and they're talking about the Greek magical papyri, but not this source. That means nobody's ever looked. Because if they'd have looked, they would have found it in 30 seconds. Yeah, Maybe yeah, it would have taken yeah. them five minutes. I'm, I'm good. Um, <laughs> but literally nobody's ever looked to see what do the rabbis say the name is, and why don't they look? So the reason they don't look, and I looked this up in Hebrew Jewish sources, you can't 
blame the pagans or the, the Christians or the agnostics for this. This is Jewish Israeli sources, an encyclopedia in Hebrew. And it's saying our rabbis, these are Orthodox Jews writing, saying our rabbis didn't know how to pronounce the name. And they give a source. So what do I do? I'm a troublemaker. I look up the source. And you know what the source says, Michael? It's a source from around 1750 from a rabbi named Elijah of Vilna. Let me read you what it says. Uh, it's pretty cool. Now, he was actually, turns out, the rabbi of my ancestor, of my fifth great-grandfather. My great-great-great-great-grandfather was the number one disciple of Elijah of Vilna. And what Elijah of Vilna, who's quoted in the encyclopedia as the source that the, that the rabbis don't know the name, what he said was... Okay, um, so this, this is a... This is a rabbi in around 1750, and it's okay. taken as well. The Jews don't know the name, Elijah Vilna. And he's a, he really is, a, he was a brilliant. He's called the Vilna Gaon, which means the genius of Vilna. And if I can find you the source, I can read it to you. And um, give me a second here. Oh, I'm doing my little search here, one second. I have, all, you know, I have like dozens and dozens of sources on my laptop here. And um, okay. So he says, the vowels of the name itself are hidden. Its vowels are the secret of the tetragrammaton. Okay, okay. so we know that. Okay. Meaning the consonants of the tetragrammaton of the name, yud heh vav -Hey, of the name of the father, that's not even a question. They're yud heh vav -Hey. The vowels are the, the secret of the tetragrammaton. And he says, the vowels of the name itself are hidden. So the modern 20th century encyclopedia written in Hebrew by rabbis say, well, well, the rabbis didn't know what the vowels were. Is that what he says? No. No, he says they're hidden. Right. He doesn't say he doesn't know what they are. Then he's, say don't know how to pronounce it. He's say, not saying I don't know how to pronounce it. He's saying this is hidden. We don't reveal this secret, <laughs> which is a big difference now. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned before that. So an encyclopedia is where people are getting their information from. The encyclopedia is incorrectly quoting the source. Well, no, it's, it's interpreting the source. Interpreting the source. And so what I do is I look up the source, and it doesn't say what they claim it says. Now, if that was all the information, you could argue back and forth, did the rabbis know what the name was, or didn't they know what the name was, right? I mean, there's a rabbi who says it's no. hidden. Mm -hmm. Is it That's hidden it. to him, or is it just hidden to the public? So... And they transmitted it every seven years. Surely there must be a trace of that somewhere in Jewish literature. That this ceremony continued of transmitting the name once every seven years. So while I was doing this research, I stumbled upon a reference to something called Sefer Hashem, the book of the divine name. It's by a rabbi named Elazar Rokeach, who's known in English usually as Elazar of Worms. Worms is a city in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, and this rabbi wrote a book in the year 1225, the Book of the Divine Name. And the th amazing thing about this is the book was never printed. And it wasn't printed until the year 2004. So this is a book that remained in handwritten manuscript form even after printing was invented because it was considered so secret. And it mm. wasn't until the 21st century that somebody decided to, you know, break the seal. I mean, because printing's so easy today. Right? Anybody with a desktop computer and a print, literally a physical printer can print a book. And, you know. So someone in 2004, for the first time, printed a book from 1225. And so I, I heard about this book of the divine name. And what it describes in it is the exact type of thing described in the Talmud, but a thousand years later, a ceremony of transmitting the name. A thousand years a after. A thousand years after Rabbi Barbar Khan is saying, sages transmit the name to the disciples. We see how this was done by this rabbi in 1225. And what he describes is this elaborate ceremony. And in the elaborate ceremony, you have a rabbi and a disciple who go through a purification process. They fast and they immerse themselves in a mikvah of water and then they don white clothing and then they do something a little bit strange at first until you read it in Hebrew. And what they, and by the way, this is never, it was printed for the first time in 2004 after nearly 800 years and it's never been translated into English. In fact, the general public will hear this text for the first time ever in English if I read you a little excerpt here, it's never been translated into English. Okay, so here it is. It's going out to more than 127 countries around the world the first there time, and here it is. <laughs> so it describes this ceremony. I won't read the whole thing because I want to get to some other things. But it talks about them fasting, and then it says the rabbi will, oh, and it says they, one of the part of the ceremony is they stand up to their, up to their ankles in water. Seems really strange. And it talks earlier in the ceremony, they reveal the name over water. 
there's a strange ceremony taking place related to water. They're immersing in water and they're standing in water and they're, so what does this mean? So it says as follows, it says, the rabbi will then open his mouth after all this preparation in awe and say, blessed are you, and then he speaks the name. Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, Yehovah, God of Israel, you are one and your name is one. And, and Michael, you are one and your name is one. That's a reference to Zechariah 14, verse nine. Michael, you know, you, you asked me the other day, we were, we were uh, discussing this beforehand. You asked me, so, so when was, you know, the, one of the first uh, times you, you, you became aware of the issue of the name? And, and, and one of the things I've shared in the past is, is you know, Zechariah 14, nine was a verse that was burned into my heart early on. It's the, actually the closing verse of daily rabbinical prayers that I grew up with. And I gotta be honest, Michael, you know, the rabbis have daily prayers that I was expected to go to. Sometimes I only came at the end. I was, <laughs> you know, I was bored during these prayers by rote, but I always loved that prayer at the end. And, and it's, it's the verse in Zechariah 14, 9. And, and I, still, I still remember it as the song I heard in the synagogue. Can I sing it for you? Bob, please do. So in Hebrew, it's, and, and remember, in the synagogue, the tradition is don't speak the name Yehovah, speak it as Adonai. So that's how I remember it. Mm -hmm. But the verse was, Vahaya Adonai. This is the closing part of the entire long 45 minute prayer service. And on Shabbat, like more than 40, like a long prayer service, It'd be like two hours. Vahaya Adonai, Limelech al kol haaretz, Bayom hahu, Bayom hahu, Yihye Adonai echad, Ushemo, Ushemo. And it shall come to pass that Yehovah will be king over the entire earth. And on that day, Yehovah will be one and his name and his name and his name will be one. So that just gets into every fiber of your being when you hear this day after day, week after week. And I remember being there in the prayers thinking what they just did for 45 minutes. Oh, I'm so bored. But this I connect to, the hope that one day Yehovah will be king over the entire earth here on earth, not in some kind of you know, mystical sense, but we'll have peace over the entire earth with Yehovah as our king, having defeated our enemies, bring peace to the world, and everyone will call on his name will be one. Everyone will call on his name. So that was early on, without even realizing I was being tied to the name, that just permeated my very soul. And that's the verse that the rabbi is referring to here when he makes the statement, blessed mm, are mm, you. Mm. And when he says it in the ceremony, he doesn't say, blessed are you, Adonai. He says, blessed are you. And he says the actual name, Yehovah. He says, blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, Yehovah, God of Israel. You are one and your name is one. And he says, you commanded us to hide your great name. Where did he command that? That's in the oral tradition, mm -hmm. right? And so as part of that tradition, we have to hide the name, but we're not blotting out the name, so we're transmitting it to our disciples. And I'll skip ahead here. He has a bunch of blessings. And then it says, the rabbi and his disciples shall place their eyes upon the water. And then they speak together in unison, the rabbi and his disciple, and they speak the name. And they speak the name by quoting a verse, Psalm 29.3. Now, 29.3 says the voice, in the King James, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. It's not a bad translation. It's the voice of Yehovah is upon the waters. Mm -hmm. But the way they understand the verse and the way they translate it, I mean, they're saying it in Hebrew, but the way they understand the verse, which is a valid way of understanding it, is the sound of Yehovah upon the water. And so at that mm -hmm. moment, they both recite together the verse based on their interpretation the sound of Yehovah upon the water. And at that moment, the rabbi has spoken it once by himself and a number of times by itself. The disciple heard it after this whole ceremony and then they speak it together to make sure the disciple heard it correctly. And this is something that the rabbis were doing in 1225. So this idea that, well, yeah, the Jews might have known the name in ancient times, but because of the ban, they forgot it. That's not consistent with the Jewish sources. And remember, this is a source that most scholars don't know about. Um, I found this buried in a series by a professor named Dan, uh, Joseph Dan. He's one of the top scholars in the world in Judaic studies. He won the Israel Prize, which is the Jewish world's equivalent of the Nobel Prize, but for Jewish studies. I did an interview with him. And he wrote a 6,000-page series, 
It's, it's, it's like 12 volumes or something so far, and it's going to be more in the end. But so far, he's written 6,000 pages. On volume six, page 561, he explains that this isn't just some theoretical thing. He says, this is something Rabbi Elazar did. This is an actual ceremony that this rabbi participated in, you know, donned white clothes and dressed, you know, having immersed in water, and then he revealed the pronunciation of the name to his disciple. So what that tells you is, we don't need to go to the Gnostic sources or pagan sources or Christian sources who didn't know Hebrew or, 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 or Latin sources. We have rabbis who knew the name. Now, I could stop here, but there's another source that confirms this. And this is a, a source that was written in Hebrew around the year 1450 by a rabbi, a little-known rabbi in Jerusalem named Joseph Ibn Sayach. And he wrote a book that's never been printed, even today. So if you wanted to read this in Hebrew, there's only one place you can find it. And I actually have here the manuscript, a photo of the manuscript. Um, in, and I've actually highlighted the section I'm going I'm to translate now. But here's the section from the manuscript. And this is interesting, this manuscript. This is the copy written by Joseph Ibn Sayyach. Not only was it never printed, but it was never even copied. There's one, this is the original. This is the original by the author. There's only one copy that ever existed, and we have his copy. And in this book, he, he answers a series of questions that people sent him as, as letters. And they would include a little bit of money, right? They'd send an email, basically, but it you know, a scroll, and they'd send some money with, and they'd say, look, Rabbi, we have a question. We need you to give us a binding answer. We have a problem in our community. And this is question number 43. I don't even know what question one through 42 are, <laughs> but you know, there's about 100 questions or something in this book. It's very common. There's uh, thousands of Jewish books like this. Many of them have never been printed. So, at least as of today, this has never been, been printed. So question number 43 that they sent to Ibn Sayyach in the 15th century in Jerusalem, and they say as follows, a certain sage has been uttering the name according to its letters, and a certain rabbi rebuked him for this, but the sage was stubborn, stubborn in his actions. So what they're mm -hmm. describing here is they're saying, Rabbi, help us. There's a sage in our community who's speaking the name yud heh and our local rabbi, the leader, rebuked him, and he says, I don't care what you say, I'm a sage. You might be a rabbi, but I'm uh, whatever a sage meant. It's an interesting uh, question. It may have meant he was some kind of mystic, maybe, I don't know. So, um, so he's being rebuked for speaking the name, this rabbi whose name we don't know. And um, that shows you somebody knew how to speak the name in the 15th century. But I thought the Jews don't know the name, right? That's the one thing all scholars can agree on. We should go look at the Gnostic. We should go look at the Greeks. We should go look at the Christians. Anybody but the Jews, because the Jews don't know the name. But here we have one source of a rabbi transmitting the name to his disciple. And in the second case, not only does the rabbi receive the name from his rabbi, from, uh, but he's speaking it out loud and getting in trouble for it. And the interesting thing is Ibn Sayyach rebukes the sage for speaking the name. He says, you're sinning. You're not allowed to speak mm. this name. It's forbidden by our tradition, not by the Torah, by our tradition. So what we've established here is that the rabbis did know how to pronounce the name. Now, I have here a map of 16 rabbis from all over the Jewish world. And you can see they go from Spain to Egypt to even Israel, Tzfat and Jerusalem, Eastern Europe. And this is, of course, the modern locations. You know, some of these go back to the year 1300, uh, rabbis who said the name is Yehovah. Some of them go into the 20th century. Ovadia Yosef, who is the leading rabbi of the, uh, of the Sephardic Jews in Israel, who only died a few years ago in the 21st century, in his, one of his books, he states matter-of-factly that the vowels are shvach olam kamatz, which is Yehovah. Hmm, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he states it as a fact. Like, it's not even a fact that's in dispute. Um, so... Um, I don't know if we have time. Can we get to some of them now? Or, or, or? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can, but uh, perhaps I need to uh, explain. Uh, you know, you and I were, were watching some uh, YouTube videos mm -hmm. now actually yeah. done in Israel of people that yeah. were explaining, you know, Gentiles explaining how to pronounce the name, mm -hmm. and it was like, you know, stopping every 30 seconds and just laughing because of of you know, just things that are just plain dead wrong, not a fact well, at all it, that, and that one of the they're, they're, they're speaking yeah. as if it's true. Right, well, one of, and one of the claims in particular that I've heard from a number of sources, um, and like I said, there's a serious book by a guy named uh, The Tetragrammaton in Western Christianity um, by the scholar who wrote this book in 2015, I think it's in Wilkinson. And in the book, he states matter-of-factly, no Jew ever said the name was Yehovah. That's a, an invention of the Christians. And I said, challenge accepted. 
And I sat down and started to do the research, and I'd heard that from other sources as well, but this was that was a straw that broke the camel's back. This isn't some crazy guy on YouTube who doesn't know Hebrew. This is a scholar who wrote a, a serious book about the Tetragrammaton as it developed in Western Christian sources. And he's making a statement that oh, all these sources just... Just blot out immediately. So he, so, so what he forced me to do was say, okay, are there Jewish sources that say the name is Yehovah? So what we established up until now is there's Jewish sources that say we know what the name is. They don't tell us how it was pronounced. For that, we have to go to other sources. That, that's one of the painful things in the book of the divine name. They're describing this whole ceremony of the rabbi revealing it to dis his disciple, but they don't tell us the pronunciation with the vowels. They're torturing us. Mm -hmm. They're almost teasing us, right? Mm -hmm. The rabbi teaches his disciple in 1225, but doesn't tell me. What good is that to me? So I found sources where it does have the pronunciation of the name. And as I told you, the first one I found was one that took me 30 seconds to find once I looked. Before I didn't look, I didn't know about it, didn't really even think about it. But mm -hmm. once I asked the, asked the question, I was able to find a rabbi within 30 seconds that, who unequivocally said the name was Yehovah. Now, the other ones, I spent months searching and researching. It was not easy at all to find. Yeah, it was actually teamwork. That it, it, that was, it, it was, well, no, the teamwork was on, on the uh, something else. This was something I, I actually did, did myself. Wow. Um, that was the manuscripts of the name, which maybe we'll get to in a future episode. I'm actually talking about rabbis who tell us that the name is Yehovah. And you can say, well, who cares what a rabbi says? And that was actually my attitude at first. And to be honest with me, what's far more important to me, which hopefully we'll get to eventually, which is how the name is written in Hebrew manuscripts. And in Hebrew manuscripts, as of today, I have 52 manuscripts where the name is written as Yehovah. But manuscripts of the, of the Bible. Bible. Of the Bible itself. And to me, one manuscript of the Bible written by the scribes who preserved the oracle of God are more important than a million rabbis. But it's worth seeing what these rabbis say because the claim is, well, no Jew ever thought it was Yehovah. Well, let's see what the rabbis say. Let the rabbis speak. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that has been taught in the Western Gentile Christian world is yeah. that uh, that yod -Heh, vav -Heh, that they inserted the vowels of Adonai in it. That's one of the claims. And, and, and that's, uh, that's, know, a that, that's a fact. That, that, that's a fact. That's but not what true. Is it? It's not true. It's <laughs> right. just plain not true at all. It's not true at all, and it's not what the rabbis thought either. With archaeological technology advancing more rapidly than any period in recorded history, an ever-increasing number of ancient Hebrew manuscripts are coming to light, and amazing things are being revealed. It doesn't matter what school you went to, where you thought you learned Hebrew, we're going to deal with things, ladies and gentlemen, that are revelation from heaven that have been set up for generations to come to pass. Michael Rood and Hebrew scholar Nehemia Gordon reveal the fulfillment of ancient prophecies in our present age in The Gentiles Shall Know My Name. Um, I looked through hundreds of manuscripts searching for this exact text. Will we listen to and heed this modern day miracle or will we ignore our master's voice and miss one of the greatest revelations of our time? Order The Gentile Shall Know My Name right now on DVD or Blu-ray. You'll get all five episodes as seen on Shabbat Night Live. Own this exclusive teaching now by phone or online. Hurry, this is a limited time offer. Gentiles have been telling us for hundreds of years that the Jews have no clue on how to pronounce a name, and so they come up with the most bizarre concepts that you could ever imagine. Well, just as the New Testament says that the communication of God, the oracles of God were committed to the Jews, and we have with us Nehemi Gordon to take us back into what do the rabbis say, and he's here with us, Nehemi, take it away. So Michael, I have to tell you that if I didn't have these databases that I could search for these sources, there's no way I would have found it, and, and, uh, and to date I found 16 rabbis who say the name is Yehovah. I, I actually have a study on my website, nehemiahswall.com, called 10 Rabbis Speak Out on the Name, just because 10 sounds better than 16. Um, <laughs> and also 10 in Jewish tradition is a prayer quorum. Uh, if you get together 10 men, that's, that's a prayer quorum. And we have 10 rabbis, technically 16, who say the name is Yehovah. I could have never found this if I didn't have a database that allowed me to search for certain things. And I'll tell you, Michael, I searched those databases for Yahweh, and I couldn't find it. But what I did find is rabbis repeatedly saying that the name is Yehovah. Now, one of the databases I searched, I mentioned before, is a database of over 100,000 books from Bar-Ilan University. And bear in mind, 
Of those, approximately uh, 16, and I say approximately, they're not all in the database. Some of them aren't even in the database. I had to find them in other places. But somewhere around that, around 10 of these sources are in the database, which means around uh, 99,990 rabbis in, these, uh, in the database don't tell us how to pronounce the name. Meaning this was intended to be a secret, mm -hmm. and we were never meant to know this. You and I sitting here were right. never the meant to know this. Right, Jew is never supposed to even hear this. And them. certainly not a Gentile. And if I had to read 100,000 books, that probably would have never happened, and I wouldn't know this. And I would go around saying what scholars, for as you said, for centuries have been saying, which is, well, the Jews didn't know how to pronounce the name. There's, we find it in the manuscripts. But after that, it disappeared and nobody knew how to uh, pronounce the name. And what we find is, in fact, this was preserved by the rabbis. Maybe not all the rabbis, but we have rabbis who preserve. I want to read one of these sources. And I can't get to all 10 of them for that. They'll have to go to my website, nehemiahswell.com. Good I'm, idea. I'm going to get this in the segment that we have. I'm going to get as many of these as I can. And so one of them is a rabbi in the 14th century named Menachem Tzioni. And he writes a commentary and in his commentary in Exodus 3.15, which is the verse where God reveals his name, and he's commenting on the words, Zesh mile olam, this is my name forever. And this is what he says. He says, there's also a secret here received by tradition in the vowels of, this is my name forever. Well, what does that mean? Well, you read in Hebrew, it's obvious. The word forever is le olam, and you can see here, I have a graphic that illustrates this. Lit Olam has the same vowels as Yehovah, which are the vowels Shvach Olam Kamatz. And this is what it looks like in English. Lit Olam, Yehovah. He's telling us the statement, this is my name forever, is itself a hint at the true pronunciation of the name. Now, is that what, Mo what God meant when he said to Moses, this is my name forever? I don't think so. But the rabbi in the, in the, this rabbi in the 14th century, Menachem Tzioni, he's saying, look, I know the secret. I received it from another rabbi who whispered it to me in my ear or over water or whatever. And the way we remember this is the verse, this is my name forever, which has the vowels of the pronunciation of the name. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Who knows what he means by this? He says, this is my name forever are the vowels of the great name. I don't know what he means. Well, thankfully he goes on and he says, it's mnemonic is who in heaven can measure up to you? A mnemonic is an acronym that helps you remember something. And the Hebrew mnemonic, you'd never get this from the English. And by the way, this has never been translated into English. I'm the first one to translate this into English um, in 2017. And the mnemonic, who in heaven can measure up to you, the word there that's the mnemonic is the word heaven, which normally is the word shamayim, but in this verse, the word is shachak. And you say, well, what is that? What's the answer? Well, Shachak is an acronym for the vowels Shva Cholam Kamatz, which are the vowels of the name Yehovah. And, and I did a thing here where in this graphic you can see the little two dots underneath the Yud. That's called a Shva in Hebrew. And it's funny because I'll, I'll talk to this uh, friend of mine who, who doesn't know Hebrew and he's studying these things and he calls it the Shiwa. But no, we call it the shva. <laughs> and then the second vowel there is called a cholam, and the third is a kamatz. And if you take the first letter of each of those words, and, and technically in English it's the first two letters of shiva, but in Hebrew that's one letter, uh, the shin, the names of these vowels form the acronym shachak, which means heaven. So the rabbi has told you it's the vowels of the word le'olam, it's the vowels that are represented by the word shachak, and this is the same rabbi. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on, he shares some other things, and I won't go into all of it, but he ends this teaching or part of it. He says, thus far, this is the most amazing part, Michael. As I'm reading this, I, I read this months ago and I'm looking at this Hebrew text and I was shaking. I was in tears. Here's a rabbi who wrote this in the 14th mm. century. So we're talking like, you know, 1375, right? That's 700 years ago. Nobody's brought this in the discussion on the name. And I'm reading this source, at least nobody I found. Has, like, they'll bring the Gnostic sources everybody, but not the Jews. Here's what the rabbi says. He's told you it's the vowels of Lolam. He tells you it's the vowels Shvach Olam Kamatz. He says that a third time, which I'm skipping to you know, save time here. Um, and then he says, thus far the words of the man who revealed the secret to me. <laughs> I got the chills when I read that. He's telling us, 
he stood mm. by a riverside with his ankles up to the water or something like that. I don't know if it was exactly that, but he participated in the chain of transmission. And he tells us that this was received by tradition. And this was revealed to him as a secret by some man. We don't know what man, but he mm. received this as a tradition that the true pronunciation of the name is Yehovah. And the way he was told to remember it is, you know, because if I pronounce a word to you and, you know, you ever probably bro broken telephone? The right, way right. the way I pronounce it might be different how you pronounce it and the way she pronounces it and the way he pronounces it. But if we have these these uh, mnemonics and, and other devices, it helps us preserve the vowels. So if we know that the acronym is Shachak, which is Shvach Olam Kamatz, and it rhymes with the vowels of Lit Olam, which is Yehovah, there's no way you can get it wrong. And he's telling us, I didn't make this up. This was revealed mm, to me mm. in the 14th century. And this is just one rabbi of 16 that I've discovered so far, there might be more, but one of uh, 16 rabbis who says the name is Yehovah, and he, and he makes it really clear what he's talking about. Um, so that's one rabbi. Uh, let me bring you another one. This other one's kind of interesting, and I want to give you the background first. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, keeping my eye on the time. I want to get to all of, I'm not going to get to all 10 or 16, I'm going to get to as many as I can. But so the background to the next one, this rabbi is a rabbi who wrote in 1608. His name is Shabtai Sofer. He's considered the greatest grammarian of the 17th century uh, and the 16th century. Um, and it's interesting because the previous rabbi, Menachem Tzioni, was a mystic. This rabbi is a grammarian. Very different mentalities for rabbis. And he's talking about a passage in the Talmud, which we, I bring in my book, Shattering the Conspiracy of Silence. The passage says that look, this ban on the name, it's only for, the, for now, and the world to come will speak the name. And here's how they phrase it. They say, this world is not like the world to come. And again, the world to come is, according to the rabbis, the kingdom under the reign of the Messiah on earth. Um, this world, the exile, is not like the kingdom of the Messiah. In this world, the name is written, yud heh vav -Hey, and it's read as Adonai. That's the tradition, to read it as Adonai. Mm -hmm. But in the world to come, it will be one, Written Yudhe Vavhe and read Yudhe Vavhe. And of course, they're referring to Zechariah 14.9, which I won't sing again. But that, they're alluding back to that. Your name will be one, you will be one, your name will be one. So this is what he says in 16.08. He writes this, as, he doesn't publish this in a book. He writes this in a letter to another rabbi, and it was never meant to be printed, but it was. So he writes this as a letter, mm -hmm. and we have the letter, and we have the response to the letter, which I'll get to in a few minutes. He says, is it not known the saying of the sages? And he quotes... That passage, in this world is written, Yudhe Vavhe and read it on I. In the world to come, it will be written, Yudhe Vavhe and read it, Yudhe Vavhe. And then he says, and behold, when it is read as Yudhe Vavhe in the world to come, then its vowels will be Shachak. And remember, Shachak is an acronym for mm -hmm. Shva Cholam Kamatz, the vowels that form in Hebrew, Yehovah. <laughs> It's beautiful. He, he's not, I mean, it's, it's amazing. And, and it's interesting. So he's a grammarian. And as a grammarian, he's asking the question, why do we have vowels in a word that we don't read? Because by Jewish tradition, we don't read the word yod heh When we see that word, we mm -hmm. read it as Adonai. Well, are those the vowels of Adonai? It's self-evident that they're not. So what are the vowels doing there? He explains, in the world to come, we'll speak that name and they they'll pick up a Bible and they'll see the vowels of the name itself, which are Shachak Shva Cholam Kamatz. <laughs> Unequivocal that this rabbi is saying the name is Yehovah, not Yahweh, not Yahuwah. Though you don't find that in Jewish sources, not at least that I found, but that it's Yehovah Shva Cholam Kamatz. Now, that rabbi is writing in 1608 and he wrote to a rabbi in Poland named uh, Maharam of Lublin, also known as Mayor of Lublin. And, and to be honest with you, he's probably the most famous, or the second most famous, at least, of all these rabbis that I quote, that I found. He's a very famous rabbi, the Maharam of Lublin, and he wrote a response to Shabdai Sofer. And I want to read this. Mm. It's amazing. So he writes to Shabdai Sofer, and they're talking about a certain grammatical point that I don't have time to get into. But while they're talking about that grammatical point that they're arguing back and forth about, they both bring up the vowels of the name. So he says, Know, my beloved, how extremely difficult it is to put things like this in writing, and even more so a letter sent about from place to place, concerning the vowels of the tetragrammaton, which are shvach olam kamatz. <laughs> like, well, not, he openly says it. He openly says it. 
openly. He's not even arguing about that point. He's saying, look, this is really hard to write this. I'm sending <laughs> this, this in a letter that's being carried by donkey or something. I don't know who's going to read this letter. You asked me, so I've got to respond to show I'm not, you know, <laughs> that I know what I'm talking about. And you, and you asked me, I've got to respond. Who's you know, the donkey that's delivering it now well, in 2017? Yeah, I'm, I'm the ass that speaks out. Uh, I wrote a, a famous paper <laughs> called The Ass Speaks Out about ba referring to Balaam's ass. Um, uh, <laughs> guys, you go read that on my website, nemiaswell.com. So he says straight out, like that's his opening. I mean, not opening, but he's saying that. Like that's just the facts we can all agree on. Concerning the Val Shvacholam Kamatz, which are Yeh, Ho, Va, Shvacholam Kamatz. And then he says, I found in the words of my grandfather, our teacher rabbi Asher Lemel, head of the Beit of Krakow, he wrote a holy book called Emek Bracha, but because of its immense holiness, it was never printed, that it not be used by those who are not worthy. And then he quotes the book of his grandfather. I'm not going to go into it, but in, uh, I'll read it. Why, why not? <laughs> so this is what it says in chapter 34. He's quoting the book of his grandfather verbatim. And it says, concerning the Tetragrammaton, its vowels received from Sinai are shvach olam kamatz. <laughs> There's no room for Yahweh here. It's Yehovah according to these rabbis. Um, you know, and you could say, who, who cares what rabbis say? And, and hopefully in the next episode, if, if you'll have me back, we'll talk about what it says in the Bible itself, in the manuscripts, we, which we, is for we me... Have, this, we'll we, have to do that, okay. because so these, we'll these the are Bible things that have not been printed, haven't been right. so, so many of them have never in the West seen, at all. Never them, many of them have never been seen except by me and this one other person. Um, so, uh, all right. So here are what rabbis are saying the name is as it was transmitted to them and preserved by them. And he's quoting his grandfather's other sources. I can't bring them all, but I think it's interesting. So he's quoting a book by his grandfather, and he says, look, this book was too holy to print. The book, book of my grandfather. I have it hand copied because I received it from my grandfather. Mm -hmm. So I contacted the National Library of Israel, and I said, you know, there's this reference to this book, Amek Bracha, written by Asher Lemel. Do you have it? And they said, well, we have 90,000 Hebrew manuscripts, and we don't have that one. As far as we know, it doesn't exist. And I asked them mm. after I had exhausted all the other databases and resources. And so as far as I know, this book was so holy, it was never printed. And because it was never printed, we only have it surviving in a quotation by the author's grandson, Maharam of Lublin, which is amazing. Um, <clears throat> so as other sources, I'm going to skip some of these. Uh, okay, so I love how Maharam of Lublin, this guy, mayor of Lublin in 160, ends a letter to Shabtai Sofer. He says, I have one request that you hide this letter in a pure and holy place and not allow it to be passed around here and there. So he wrote this letter as a response to another rabbi stating matter-of-factly the information. He knew as a secret that the name was Yehovah and that his grandfather knew as a secret that it was Yehovah. And he said, look, it's hard to write this. To, who knows who's going to read it? Make sure that you hide this letter after you've read it. And you know what? When he died, his disciples found a copy of the letter and they printed it. And because of that, we're able to sit here and share this with the entire world. We right. were never meant to know what's in this letter. This was meant to be a secret. Now, Michael, I was doing this research and you have to understand, I was waking up and I was going till, you know, be like 9 p.m. at night. And I was thinking, okay, I found this source and I got to find the other source. Five more minutes and it'd be three in the morning and then five in the morning. And finally, I'd have to go to sleep and sleep for a few hours and then wake up. And, you know, I've shared this with a friend who's, who's a Methodist. And he said, Nehemia, do you know what we call that in my tradition? I said, no, what? He said, Nehemia, you're arrested by the spirit. I said, okay, I wouldn't call it that necessarily, but it's true. I couldn't put this down. I was so engrossed in this. I was finding these sources. There was one source I couldn't find online or in any of my databases, but I found out there was a library uh, or a bookstore, a used bookstore in Jerusalem that had a copy of a certain book I needed. So I called up a friend in Israel and I said, I'm begging you, stop everything you're doing. Go to that bookstore, buy the book and overnight it to me. And it took three days to overnight it from Israel. I was shaking for three days and couldn't sleep while I was waiting. And when I got it, it just didn't, didn't disappoint. It was, it, mm. it, was, it was amazing, these things. So while I was doing this, Michael, I had to clear my head. My head was spinning. Now, one of the things I've shared, and I think I've shared this with you, I definitely shared it publicly, is that on my mother's side, I'm descended from this famous rabbi named Zalmala of Volazhin, and he, according to my uncle and cousin, was a descendant of King David. And as I was doing this research, looking at these sources, I decided, you know what? I've been sharing that for years, and I'd like to dig down to the sources and find out, is it even true? 
you know? And, and, and I was pretty certain I was descended from Zalmala of Volushim, but I didn't know how. I knew my great-grandfather, Nehemiah Robinson, after whom I'm named, was his descendant. But how? What are their names? How does it tie in? So I start doing this genealogy research, and I started on Ancestry.com. I mean, really simple. Paid the money. Mm -hmm. I end up on all these different websites. Um, I end up finding my great, great, I think third great grandfather or something, uh, birth certificate written in Hebrew from Lithuania from 1846. And that traces me back eventually to this woman who's the daughter of Rabbi Zalmal of Volazhin. And my ancestor was a rabbi who married the daughter of this other rabbi, right? Now we didn't, nobody knew the name of this woman. That, and this is my claim to descending from the famous rabbi, okay. is that his daughter married this other rabbi, and she's my great, 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 great grandmother. And in all the Jewish sources, there were books written in Jewish, Jewish genealogy, all the Jewish sources, I contacted the people who wrote the books, and they said, we don't know her name. As far as we know, her name is, ba uh, or not her name, but the way we refer to her is Batsheva. And why Batsheva? Her father died in 1788 when she was seven years old. And then she oh. was raised, and when she was you know, a little bit older, she was married off to my ancestor, um, who was a famous rabbi, and uh, another rabbi. But the real claim to descent that I had, I mean, this is you know, very personal for me, was through this woman who nobody knows the name of. They call her seven-year-old girl. And I found the source of this. It's a book from the year 1900 called Ir Vilna, about the city of Vilnius. And she's described as Batsheva, the seven-year-old girl, little seven-year-old girl, Batsheva. <laughs> And I thought, well, that's kind of tragic, <laughs> yeah, right? No name. No name. And, and, and you know what was, what's really bizarre? So her husband wasn't as famous as her father. We know her father's name and her husband's name, but we don't know her name, right? So her husband's claim to fame is he married the seven, you know, she was more than seven when she got married, right? <laughs> um, he married the girl who had survived the man at, when, you know, in 1788 when she was seven years old, but nobody knew her name. So I started digging. And I thought, you know, names are so important in Jewish sources and in, in the Jewish culture. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I could, and I had no hope. I, I, I literally talked to the man who wrote the book on Jewish genealogy, exchanged emails with him, and he says, we just call her seven-year-old little girl. Nobody knows, and there's actually thousands of Jews descended from her. Like, I'm not unique, right? There's a lot of people descended from this woman, seven-year-old little girl, and I'm digging through these sources, and what happened is there's Jews who went to Lithuania and photographed these sources and transcribed them, and you can search them. And it, I spent dozens of hours searching these sources, and I ended up finding a Russian census record from 1816. And, and really, this was a tax record, meaning every time a Jew was born and every time a Jew died, they wrote it down in a ledger. The rabbi's job was to write it in a ledger, and the purpose was so that the Russian Empire could tax them. And in the Jewish sources, they don't mention her name, but in the Russian sources, they do, because she was taxable. And her name was Sarah. <laughs> and I cried when I find out. The name of my ancestor who nobody, nobody, there's thousands of Jews who are descended from this woman and they call her seven-year-old little girl. And in the tax records, her name is Sarah Navidel. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. We find out her name and, and, and God's name is such a powerful name. How can that be lost? Right? I mean, here's some woman who really isn't important in history. Besides a few thousand Jews descended from her, nobody ever heard of her right? You know, a small group of people in planet Earth. This is the creator of the universe. We should all know his name. It should be proclaimed from every rooftop. Now, Michael, when I sat down to do this little side project to clear my head, what I didn't know, and I discovered through the process, is that not only was I descended from Zalman of Volazhin, which I, I knew, I just didn't know how, it turns out mayor of Lublin, Maharam of Lublin, is my 11th great-grandfather. Meaning, if you say great 11 times, he is my great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather is this very same rabbi who said that hide this letter in a pure and holy place, that things like this should never be printed, lest the unworthy read them, that the name is Shvach Olam Kamatz Yehovah. He's my direct ancestor. I had wow. no inkling of that whatsoever. I had heard of this rabbi. I didn't know I was descended from him. Once I found all the genealogy, he's my 11th great-grandfather, the very same rabbi who was part of the conspiracy of silence to hide the name. And when I discovered this, I realized throughout my whole life I'd had this burning, nagging feeling, I need to shatter the conspiracy of silence. I even named my book that to find out what the name is, proclaim it to the world, 
and I could never fully explain why it is I have this burning feeling like that. And then I find out literally the, the blood of the man of the rabbi who hid the name in 1608, who said, hide this letter and appear in a holy place, lest the unworthy find out his name is Yehovah. His blood is coursing through my veins. He's my direct ancestor. And what I realized, Michael, is that this is an ancestral duty I have. And I never mm -hmm. fully, under, and mm -hmm. I've actually said this in the past, that it's part of my duty to make up for the sins of my ancestors, for the collective sin of my people, of hiding the name of the creator. But when I said that, I meant the sins of my people, you know, of my ancestors, in a general sense, not literally that my ancestors in a direct line hid the name, but it turns out literally my ancestors were part of the conspiracy to hide our father's name. And Michael, I have, I have to confess and repent here for, for the sin of the, of the collective sin of the generations. You know, we have the story in Joshua where they, um, you know, they, they stole the, uh, the they, they took from the, the gold and that they weren't supposed to take from, from Jericho, and it became a sin, the collective sin of the people. And we have this verse in Jeremiah 23, 27. It says, they plan to make my people forget my name. And that's part of mm, my heritage. Mm, mm. And I need to go back to what it says in the Bible and not continue the tradition of hiding the name. Now, I have a whole bunch of other sources. I want to end with a rabbi from 1896. He was a rabbi named Jacob Backrack. And in 1896, he writes a whole bunch of things. I'll read this really quick. He says, if the vowels of the Tetragrammaton were indeed the vowels of Adonai, precision would have required putting Chat of Patach under the Yud for the Aleph of Adonai. Those who don't know what that means, go and you know, research that. Anybody who you tell in scholarship that these are the vowels of the name Yehovah, they'll say, well, no, that's the vowels of Adonai, and here's why. Here's a rabbi in 1896 who says that's utter nonsense that that's completely a misunderstanding of the vowels. Let me read you the end of what he says after saying the vowels are shvach olam kamatz. He says, according to the rulings that have come down to us, this is a rabbi, there is no prohibition from the Torah to speak the name the way it is written. However, the custom not to pronounce the name the way it is written is very old. Thus, it is not right to pronounce the name. In other words, he's saying, look, it's not a Torah prohibition, but we're not allowed to do it because we have a, a custom not to do it. But he said, and he ends, there's no prohibition from the Torah. And then he says, there was a time, meaning in history, there was a time, it's a rabbi in 1896 saying this, Michael. There was a time and there shall again be a time, a time when all the peoples, all of them, will call on the name of Yehovah. And Yehovah will be one and his name will be one. That's Zechariah 14.9 again. For this tradition of reading what is not written, Adonai, which, that is Lord, will be completely abolished. And then we will all read it the way it is written as Yehovah. So we have this chorus of rabbis. We have what we call in Hebrew a minion of rabbis, a quorum of 10, even 16 rabbis proclaiming that the name is Yehovah. And I haven't found any of these early Jewish sources or medieval Jewish sources even that say the name is Yahweh, the same the name is Yahuwah. What I found is these rabbis repeatedly saying this is, the name is Yehovah, and you can't let people know this. And even my own ancestors were part of that conspiracy of silence. Michael, we read those prophecies. The world needs to know what that name is. It needs to be proclaimed to all the nations. And may the prayer of this rabbi be fulfilled. As the prophet says, all those who call upon the name of Yehovah will be saved. You wanna call upon the name of Hashem, Oh, what's his name, Adonai, uh, Yahweh, whatever. You're on your own. You're on your own because he is making his name known. Those things were hidden hundreds of years ago and hidden by Nehemiah's ancestor and said this should not get out, should not get in the hands of the unworthy, now is being declared to the entire world by his great, 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 great grandson to the entire world. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to open your eyes, lift up your ears. The living oracles of God, the communication of the Almighty was committed to the Jews. It is time for the Gentiles, 10 Gentiles, to take a hold of the hem of the, the Jew and say, teach us, teach us, because this is what was prophesied. The Gentiles would admit that we've inherited lies. Only the arrogant, 
will stand on their own ground and say, oh, we're just gonna go by our own Gentile speculation. Ladies and gentlemen, the brimstone is about to hit the fan. We are going to go next week and we're gonna find out right from the sources of the Hebrew Bible, Bibles that have never been uh, even seen outside, you know, for hundreds of years, you're gonna see it here next week on Shabbat Night Live. Nehemia, would you please close with the ironic blessing? Yes, Michael. Yevarechecha Yehovah v'yishmerecha. Yehovah bless you and keep you. Ya'er Yehovah panav elecha v'chuneka. Yehovah shine his face towards you and be gracious towards you. Yisa Yehovah panav elecha. Yehovah lift his face towards you. V'yasem lecha shalom. And may he give you peace. Amen. 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 Well, Shabbat Shalom to our fans. Shavuoto. See you next week on Shabbat Night Live. This is gonna be the ride of your life.